this is section 3.7. 3.7 is about cross products. Now we just did dot products. So cross products uh, will have a few similarities. You'll see some dot products mentioned within um, some of the properties. But uh, cross products a little more involved than dot products. So let's take a look at cross products. Section 3.7. Now we're actually going to learn three ways to do cross products. You can choose the way that you like. Um, you actually have a choice in this section as to how you want to do these problems. Here's why we're doing cross products to start with. Suppose we want a third vector that's perpendicular to each of the given two vectors. Okay, so we'll be given two vectors. We'll be asked to come up with a third vector that's perpendicular to both of them. Now, if you can imagine what we'd have to have in this situation, we'd have to have a vector coming either out of the screen or going behind the screen. Hopefully you can kind of picture that. All right, in this section we'll be looking for a vector that is orthogonal, because remember we don't say perpendicular, we say orthogonal when we're talking about vectors. It'll be orthogonal to two, to two given vectors. There are an infinite number of answers. Now why? We said in that previous one that it was only the one coming out from the screen and the one going behind the screen. Now how did I suddenly go from saying two to saying infinite? Do you know? Well, it's because we didn't mention how long that vector was. Okay, the one coming out of the screen could be any length. It could be one unit long, it could be two units long, it could be pi units long. You know, there's an infinite number of lengths, therefore there's an infinite number of answers. Now, the one going behind the screen, wasn't that just the negative of the one coming out? Okay, so since there are an infinite number of answers, we're just going to be looking for a specific one of those, and it's going to be called the cross product. Right, like I said, there are three ways to find the cross product of two three-dimensional vectors. And the cross product, by the way, is denoted u cross v. Well, one way is you can memorize a formula. If u is u1, u2, and u3, and v is v1, v2, and v3, then the cross product of u and v is the vector u2 v3 minus u3 u3 v2. That's in the first row. Then in the second, it's u3 v1 minus u1 v3. And in the third, u1 v2 minus u2 v1. Okay, now you can memorize that, but as you saw, you know, I can't even say it, so it was tough for me to memorize this when I was a student. So there are other ways. We'll take a look at, at a couple of other ways. <clears throat> the second way is you can do u cross v as a determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix. Now across the first row of the matrix is i, j, k. Those are the basic unit vectors that we've talked about before. The second row would be the u vector, u1, u2, u3. And the third row would be the v vector, v1, v2, v3. If we were to expand along row one, and by the way, you always want to expand along row one when you're doing cross products this way, we would get i times the determinant of a two by two, plus, if you remember, it was j times negative one, because in that um, second position, we always wound up with negative one to the one plus two, so it was a negative one, um, and then times that determinant, that little two by two, and then plus k times another determinant of a 2 by 2. Now magically what happens is when you do those determinants you get the same thing we had before. You get the u2 v3 minus v2 u3 and you get the u1 v3 minus u3 v1 and so on. Okay, It all works out to be the exact same thing. Now you'll notice with the minus in the middle you, if you distribute the minus that's in front of the um, coefficient of the j, it does turn out to be the exact same formula that we came up with before. Okay, so there's a little less to remember in that one. There's definitely more um, time involved, but you do come up with the same answer in the end. All right, so it's all up to you as to whether you want to memorize the formula that you see on the screen now, or if you want to do it as a determinant, and you'll come up with the same answer. I think most people choose to do it as a determinant, but like I said, your choice. All right, let's take a look at an example.
Let's find u cross v for u being the vector 1, 2, 3, and v is the vector 0, 3, negative 1. All right, if we decide to just memorize the formula, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. You just plug in the numbers. So I'd have 2 times negative 1 minus 3 times 3. Then in the second um, position, the second row, I would have 3 times 0 minus 1 times negative 1. And in the third, I would have 1 times 3 minus 2 times 0. And I get the answer of negative 11, 1, 3. Now that is a vector. It's a three-dimensional vector. And it wasn't that bad to find because, like I said, we just memorized a formula, plugged in the numbers, worked it out. Okay, now if you find that it's difficult to memorize the formula, instead, like I said, it takes longer, but there's less to remember, you can do it this way. Put i, j, k across the top, those are the basic unit vectors, then u goes in the second row, the 1, 2, 3, and then the v goes in the third, 0, 3, negative 1. Okay, now expand across the first row. Always go across the first row when you're doing a cross product. All right, I get I times the matrix 2, 3, 3, negative 1, minus J times the little 2 by 2 matrix 1, 3, 0, negative 1, plus K times the matrix 1, 2, 0, 3. All right, now each one of those is pretty simple to work out. I'd have I times 2 times negative 1 minus 3 times 3, and then minus J times 1 times negative 1 minus 0 times 3, plus K times 1 times 3 minus 0 times 2. I get I times negative 2 minus 9 minus J times uh, negative 1 and then plus K times 3, which is the exact same answer we got before, negative 11I plus J plus 3K. Same answer, it's an IJK form, but that's easy enough to convert to negative 11, 1, 3. Got the same answer, little more paper involved, little more writing involved, but um, less memorization. All right, let's just double check, and this is a good idea to do if you have time. Um, is this orthogonal to both U and V? So let's just check to see, and I called it W, just for lack of a better name. Let's take our negative 11, 1, 3 that we found before and just double check that it's orthogonal to u. Well, remember how you check orthogonality is you multiply, uh, not multiply, but dot the two vectors. So you'll multiply the, um, x, um, the x row, the y row, the z row, so on, the corresponding entries. So 1 times negative 11, 2 times 1, and 3 times 3. Does that all add up to 0? Hey, look at it. It does. What if I check it with V? And it doesn't matter about the order here either. Remember with dot products, the order was not important. U dot W is the same thing as W dot U. Okay, so if I do V dot W, I get 0 times negative 11 plus 3 times 1 plus negative 3, or negative 1 times 3, which is 0. Okay, so it really was orthogonal to both of them. Let's look at some properties <clears throat> of the cross product. Remember, anytime you learn something new in mathematics, you have to learn all the properties. And in this one, we see that u cross v is the negative of v cross u. So if I switch the order of a cross product, it's not like a dot product. With dots, u dot v and v dot u are the same thing. But in cross products, the sign changes, s-i-g-n changes. All right, also, if I were to cross u with u, I would get 0. If I were to cross c times u, and now in this one, u is a vector, v is a vector, but c is going to be a constant. Okay, so if I cross the constant c times u, and then cross that with v, <clears throat> that would be the same thing as if I just slide the C over to be with a V, or if I totally factor the C out, cross the U and the V, and then multiply by C. So that little C can move basically wherever it wants to be. It can hang with the U, it can hang with the V, or it can be factored out completely. All right, next. This gives me a distributive property. 
if I have u cross the quantity v plus w. That's the same thing as u cross v plus u cross w. So I do have a distributive property over addition. And then the last property. It's going to sound kind of crazy, but it's going to come in handy later. If I have u dot the quantity v cross w, that's the same thing as u cross v dot w. Okay, so a cross product and a dot product can kind of move around. Pretty strange. Hmm. I'm not going to try to prove that one to you, but we will use it later. Okay, now let's take a look at an illustration of the first property, which was the fact that v cross u would be the negative of u cross v. Now, I already know the answer. I know that um, what I would need to do is just take the answer I found before and put negatives in front of everything. But <clears throat> um, if I were to do v cross u, like I said, it's, it's going to be the negative of what I got before. And before I got negative 11, positive 1, and positive 3. So if I check what happens when I plug in to that first formula, if you decide to do it that way. I really do get 3 times 3 minus 2 times negative 1. That really is 11, positive 11. And then the 1 times negative 1 minus 3 times 0, I really do get a negative 1. And then 2 times 0 minus 3, I really do get minus 3. Okay, so v cross u is the negative of u cross v. Okay, a look at the second property. If I were to cross u and u, and that's where u was the first u from before the 1, 2, 3. And this time I've decided to show you with the um, determinant. If I do the i, j, k, and then 1, 2, 3, and then 1, 2, 3 again, and expand along the first row, I get i times, look at that, the the second, um, the first row, excuse me, the 2, 3, and the second row, the 2, 3, they're the same. And then minus j, and it happens again. I have 1, 3, 1, 3. And then plus k, and then I have 1, 2, 1, 2. Hmm. What's going to happen if I do the determinants of those little 2 by 2s? I'll get 2 times 3 minus 2 times 3. And then what about the second one? I'll get 1 times 3 minus 1 times 3. And the last, 1 times 2 minus 1 times 2, they all cancel out. So I'll get 0i minus 0j plus 0k. Well, isn't that just 0? Yes, it is if I'm in an ijk form. But you kind of have to be careful here. We said that a cross product is going to be a vector. So when I say u cross u is 0, I don't mean the number 0. I mean the vector 0. I mean the 0 vector. Okay, so we're actually talking about the vector 0, 0, 0. Now, obviously, in IJK form, when you say 0, I, 0, K, 0, J, not in that order, I do just say 0 in IJK form. But I am talking about an actual vector. So keep that in mind. Try not to be confused by that. <clears throat> cross product is a vector. All right, now the cross products of basic unit vectors. If I need to cross i and j in that order, I'm going to get k. Now, you can find that from working it out the long way. Um, don't let it confuse you, though. If i is 1, 0, which you would think of as being a two-dimensional vector, and j is 0, 1, which you would think of as being a two-dimensional vector, when you actually cross those, you need to make i 1, 0, 0, and j 0, 1, 0. Okay, anytime you do cross products, you have to convert two-dimensional vectors into three-dimensional vectors. It's pretty quick, though. You just throw a zero at the bottom. Okay, so I cross J is K. J cross K is I. And K cross I is J. Now, again, this is something you can memorize. Or I have a little trick for you that will make it a little simpler. If you put them in order I, J, K and you think of everything as going clockwise, i to j, j to k, and k back to i. Okay, if you have everything going clockwise, then when you need to figure out something like k cross i, 
Okay, now anything that goes clockwise is fine. Anything that goes clockwise is actually going to be positive. So if I go k to i, I'm going to get, still going clockwise, j. All right. If I need to find out j cross k, this again goes clockwise. j to k, clockwise, and then k to i, clockwise. All right, but if things were to go counterclockwise, if, for example, I had asked you k cross j instead, that's going counterclockwise. So that's going to give me negative i. k cross j would be negative i. Okay. So if it doesn't go clockwise, it's going to be negative. <clears throat> All right, with that in mind, and with those properties in mind, I have the third way to do cross products. Some people love this way because it's very, very algebraic. It's going to remind you of a lot of when you did um, distributive property in algebra with polynomials. Okay, this time I'm going to write u not as 1, 2, 3, but as i plus 2j plus 3k. Remember, remember those are equal though. And then v, instead of writing 0, 3, negative 1, I write 3j minus k. And then I want to find u cross v. Okay, like I said, it's going to seem very algebraic. What I do is I take the vector i plus 2j plus 3k and cross it by the vector 3j minus k. All right, there was a property that said I could distribute, right? Remember that one? So what I want to do is I want to take everybody in the first set, make sure it shakes hands with everybody in the second set. So it's just like the good old days of Algebra 1 when you used to say, okay, well, I cross 3J plus, then the I again cross negative K. And then you move to the second one, the 2J. 2J cross 3J plus 2J cross negative K plus, and then you go to the 3K. 3K cross 3J plus 3K cross negative K. Okay, so that should seem really familiar to you. The thing is you can't um, change those orders without changing the signs, remember, because it's not times that we're doing, it's cross. And changing the orders changes the signs. All right, next. Didn't we say something cross itself was zero? That gives me the right to mark out the 2j cross 3j. That's just going to be 6 times zero, so that's gone. What about 3k cross negative k? Again, since k cross k is going to be 0, I don't worry about negative 3 times it. Okay, so those two are gone. All right. There was also a property that said I could factor out constants. Remember the one with the c in it? And the c could be with the u, it could be with a v, or it could be out front. Okay, that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to do 3, to, um, three times i cross j. And then the negative 1 that's with the k, I move that out front. So negative or minus i cross k. Then I had a 2 and a negative that I can pull out front again. So I have minus 2 times j cross k. And then I had two 3's in there, so I can pull that out front. So I have plus 9k cross j. Okay, so I used that property as well. Now, last. I'm going to say that i cross j is k, then i cross k is actually negative j, so I have a minus negative j that becomes plus j. j cross k was i, so I have minus 2i, and then k cross j was negative i, so I have minus 9i. And last, group together your like terms, and I have negative 11i plus j plus 3k, the exact same answer that I got the other two ways. Okay, so here's your third way to do cross products. It's totally your choice as to whether you want to do it this way or if you want to do it one or the other two. Some people love it, some people hate it. But anyway, here it is just for your information. Okay, next, there's a theorem that says the length of u cross v, the length of that vector, is equal to the length of u times the length of v times the sine of theta the angle in between them. OK, 
Okay, so if theta is the angle in between the two vectors, u and v, you have this theorem. More commonly, you'll probably see it in the form of sine of theta is equal to the length of the cross product, u and v, over the length of u times the length of v. That's the more common way of seeing that theorem and the more common way of using that theorem. Now, you'll see at the top, you have u cross v, and then you have to take the length of it. Doesn't that seem kind of involved? Didn't we just learn three different ways to do a cross product because that took some time? Okay, and then finding the length. That also takes a little bit of time. So you can see how this wouldn't be quite as popular as the one we learned in the last section. The cosine of theta is equal to u dot v. Remember how fast it was to do a dot product? You just match up the corresponding entries and multiply and add them up and you're done. Okay, so this is going to be much faster. If you need to find theta, it's going to be much faster to use the cosine of theta is equal to u dot v over length of u length of v than it will be to use the sine of theta is equal to the length of the cross product divided by, you, you can see where I'm going here. Okay, and it's also pretty quick if you remember a little bit of trig to find sine from cosine. So even if you needed um, to know the sine of the angle, once you have the cosine of the angle, it was pretty fast to find the sine. All right, next theorem. For the parallelogram A, B, C, D, if I needed to find the area of that parallelogram, the area is going to be equal to the length of the cross product AB cross AD. Okay, now you'll notice at the corner, AB is one of the vectors that forms the parallelogram. AB and, C and DC are equal. And then AD is also one of the vectors that forms the parallelogram. AD would be equal to BC. Because remember, two vectors are equal if they have, what, the same direction and the same length, same magnitude. So the area would be AB cross AD. Or instead, you could have done um, DA cross DC, or you could have done CD cross CB, or so on. You just pick any corner, and you take the two vectors that form that corner, because reproducing those two vectors forms the whole thing. Cross those two vectors, then take the length. And you do always want to make sure you got a positive number, otherwise there's a mistake somewhere. Okay, So any two vectors that form this parallelogram, cross them, then take the length. And by the way, what if I had needed a triangle instead of a parallelogram? Remember, a triangle is half a parallelogram. So it would just be a matter of finding the area of the parallelogram and then taking half. Okay, the volume of a parallelopiped. I know it sounds crazy, but all it is is a 3D parallelogram. It looks like a box that somebody sat on. The volume of a parallelopiped is u dot the quantity v cross w, and then you take the absolute value. So the absolute value of the quantity u dot v cross w. Now, according to that formula, I'm supposed to cross v and w first, and then dot with u, and then take the absolute value. Well, if you remember from way back, we had a property, so a few screens back, that said u dot v cross w is the same thing as u cross v dot w. That's where the good news comes in. It actually turns out you can take any three vectors that form the parallelopiped. Okay, so if I have u, v, and w. And they form this parallelopiped because if I keep reproducing them, I get the 3D parallelogram that I was talking about. So by giving you that property from before, what's happening is it gives you the right to, to pick those three vectors and actually do them in any order. I could cross any two of them and dot with the third, as long as I remember to take the absolute value. Now that's using the properties from before. Okay, so pick any two vectors that form a corner of this parallelopiped thing, 
any two vectors, cross them, dot with the third, take the absolute value. Then everything will be fine with that one. Okay, a couple more theorems. One says u and v are collinear. That means they're on the same line. If and only if u cross v is zero. Okay, so if I try to find a cross product and I get zero, that means they had to have been on the same line. Another theorem says u, v, and w are coplanar. That means they're all in the same plane. If and only if u dot v cross w is zero. Now, where did you see u dot v cross w before? Just on the previous screen, right? We said if we need the volume of a 3D parallelogram, okay, that that's what we would use, except we'd take absolute value. Well, this is saying that if we take that volume and we get zero, then everything was in the same plane. Well, that should make sense, because if you take the volume of something, you get zero, that means it's flat, okay? So this had no volume. In other words, it was all in one plane to start with. Okay, so <clears throat> that was section 3.7, cross products. As you saw, we had three ways you can do cross products. One involved just memorizing a formula. And if you're comfortable with that, go ahead. That, that's really fast. Um, if you didn't like memorizing the formula, though, you had the option of doing a 3 by 3 determinant with i, j, k across the top row, u, and then v, um, and working that out. And that gave you the same answer. The third way involved a lot of properties and then the basic unit vectors. It's totally your choice as to which way you decide to do cross products. Um, go ahead and practice all three ways. You'll find that even if you hate that determinant way right now, as you practice it a little bit, it'll get faster. Or if you hate that uh, unit vector way, you know, as you practice that, that'll also get faster. So give it some, give it some practice and uh, good luck with it. I think it'll go really well.